Today is January 26, 2018, and tonight we will be continuing our investigation of a testimony by Ellen White, published in Volume 3 of the Testimonies for the Church, called Experience Not Reliable. So let's start with asking our Heavenly Family to guide us. Heavenly Family, thank you once again for the testimonies and for speaking to us continually without giving up on us and for educating us in the ways of truth and love. Please help us to harmonize our lives with the principles that we're learning. Help us to understand these principles tonight. Help us to express them more clearly than ever before and to be able to use what we learn to radically change the world. Thank you. Guide us in this. We ask it in the name of Branch, he and she. Amen. Amen. All right. So the testimony that we are reading starts on page 67 of Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, but we have already read several pages of it, and so we are actually going to be starting on page 71, but before we get into reading it, I just want to explain a little bit in terms of why we are going through this particular testimony and some of the points of emphasis that I want to make. So, this testimony, Experience Not Reliable, has to do with how we can come to reliable conclusions and how not to come to reliable conclusions. And we ended up kind of coming to this for a couple of reasons. One is that we have had recent discussions related to materialism. And in those discussions, several times, the question of epistemology, how to come to know, came up. We have had somewhat in-depth discussions on how to come to know things in the past, and we have published several different videos on the subject on YouTube, one of which is a series of seven videos called Genuine Experience. There's also a series called Ellen White on Experimental Knowledge and Religion. This is a two-part series. We have a two-part series called What is Truth? A two-part series called Understanding Knowledge. A video called The Science of Knowing. And I'm sure if you look on the Seven Angels Messages YouTube channel, you will find more related to this general topic. That said, there are elements involved in this discussion which we haven't quite emphasized before, but which recur several times throughout the course of this testimony, experience not reliable. And so one of those points that is brought up is the relationship between how we come to know things, and science. And in short, in this testimony, Ellen White advocates the scientific method as the only reliable means by which we may come to know something. That's how we can obtain genuine knowledge. She discusses other ways in which people come to know things, namely their feelings, 
their biases, their experience, and in this context, she refers to that type of experience in terms which reveal that the idea she had in mind is merely circumstances through which one passes and interprets in order to draw certain conclusions. She refers to that type of experience as resulting from simply habit or mere indulgence blindly and frequently ignorantly followed with a firm set determination and without intelligent thought or inquiry relative to the laws at work in the accomplishment of the result. That is how she describes the sort of experience which is so common, which many term experience, but is not genuine experience. Genuine experience, on the other hand, she describes as being the result of a variety of careful experiments made with the mind freed from prejudice and uncontrolled by previously established opinions and habits. She talks about actual experiment with thorough investigation, with a knowledge of the principles involved in the action. She describes genuine experiment being very, very careful, taking note of the results, and in short, she describes it as being the scientific method. Now, she doesn't go into detail in terms of forming a hypothesis, testing that hypothesis. Like, she doesn't use those classical terms for describing the scientific method. But the terms that she does use cannot describe anything less than the scientific method. It is clearly rigorous experiment, checking and rechecking, and she even uses the term science. She contrasts genuine experience with false experience, and false experience she characterizes as being superstition arising from a diseased imagination arraying one in conflict with science and principle. She describes false experience as being contrary to natural law and science by definition, and true experience, on page 71, she says true experience is in harmony with natural law and science. So, it's a very, very important topic, and again, the reason why we're going through this testimony is in light of recent discussions, and also, Teresa and I were led to this testimony due to going through a series of videos which Teresa made, which is published on the Timeless Testimonies YouTube channel, called the Nature and Influence of the Testimonies, which is an excellent series of videos. If anyone here has not seen that series, I highly recommend to watch the whole thing. It really goes through a lot of very important principles related to the testimonies for the Church, which, as Ellen White has stated, and which Teresa wonderfully reminds us of, the testimonies for the Church are a part of the Third Angel's message. So it's very important for all of us who profess to believe in the Third Angel's message to be acquainted with the testimonies. Ellen White frequently pointed out the deplorable spiritual condition of the Church in no small part due to neglecting the testimonies. Victor Hotev also often emphasized the importance of the testimonies and the deplorable state of the church brought on by neglecting the testimonies. So, in any case, those are really how we got to this testimony. 
And some of the points that I really want us to learn from this and to gain from this are first a clearer understanding of how to obtain knowledge and to encourage us all to cease from depending upon that which is not genuine experience and to move from being people who believe things for bad reasons to being people who only believe what we know to be true based on actual evidence. The second aspect that I really want to emphasize, which is not really so different from the first aspect, but it's different in nuance and different in implications, is that we need to view science rightly. And most branches, Davidians, Adventists, Christians, and religious people at large have not been in the habit of viewing science rightly. People often view science with suspicion. People view science and scientists often from a conspiratorial point of view as though science is out to be against, quote-unquote, the truth. Science is viewed as taking people away from the Bible, which is actually often the case. Science is often viewed as being antithetical to faith, which, if we define faith as most people do, then I would certainly agree with that. So science is, again, viewed negatively very often from the perspective of religious people. But this testimony from Ellen White that we have been going through is really promoting science so fully, and yet it is written by a woman who was entirely devoted to what most people would view as a religious mission. Now, what we have learned in this message in light of materialism is that faith as defined by most people is a bad thing because faith as defined by most people is believing something in spite of a lack of sufficient evidence to prove that it is true. That's how most people define faith. Faith is the thing which fills the gap. And we've all heard people say, and we have all most likely said things like, oh, well, you got to have faith. Or, oh, well, the reason why you can't prove that is because there'd be no need for faith then. Okay, so that just reveals that people do view faith as being believing in spite of sufficient evidence to prove something as being true. Well, we've learned that that is bad. <laughs> that is totally contrary to materialism, it is totally contrary to a love for the truth, because if you can't show something to be true, you don't know that thing to be true, and thus you would be not justified in believing it is true. It's really just presumption. This is what Ellen White was getting at, that presumption is the counterfeit of faith. And Teresa just pulled up one of my favorite statements of all time. It's found in several places. Oh, here we go. Steps to Christ is where you find it. 
Okay, Steps to Christ, we'll go with that one, even though that may not, that's actually not the earliest reference, most likely. No, but it's not. one of the most easily accessible references mm. in any case. This is the sentence, so I'll just read this one sentence. This is from Steps to Christ by Ellen White, page 105, paragraph 2. It says, God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. Mm -hmm. Now, that's quite significant. God never asks us to believe something for which he does not give us sufficient evidence. So if there's something for which you do not have sufficient evidence, do not think that God asks you to believe that. One of the things that I want us to really gain from this testimony is a proper view of science because often people, because of a view which is based upon false experience, which Ellen White says is the number one cause of gaining and retaining erroneous views, people often from this wrong perspective, end up arraying themselves against science and doing themselves great harm. And we talked about that in our last meeting. And I want to, even before reading, mention a little bit of this again. People often develop views in regard to health, and I'll give the health example again as we did in last weekend's meetings, because that is the issue that Ellen White is dealing with in this testimony. People often develop views about health which are not based on science, which are not based on actual experiment and rigorous methods, and thus end up promoting views which are based upon experience and feeling and political perspectives and so on. And hence, we have the alternative health field, as it is sometimes called, which is a multi-billion dollar per year industry. And it is full of what Victor Hoddeth terms quackery in The Entering Wedge Part 2. And being a multi-billion dollar per year industry, it is extremely sad to me that so many people pump so much money into that which is not shown to be valid, even though, of course, there's bound to be things by fluke, <laughs> that are in this world of things that are valid, but the point is you can't know it and you cannot legitimately use it unless and until it has been experimentally verified. So the sad thing is that people are pumping billions of dollars a year into this industry which is not interested in actually doing scientific research when if we thought right about experience and about how to come to conclusions in general, we would be taking those billions of dollars per year that are put into alternative health and putting it into real science-based medicine and actually make a lot faster headway against disease, because science-based medicine is making real headway against disease. I'd like to just add, not just into purchasing things, what you mean is investing in research and development and advancing technology and discovery and finding actual cures, actual treatments. Absolutely. One of the biggest blockages to the advancement of true medicine today is lack of money 
for scientists conducting research because it is expensive to develop the incredible, fascinating, intricate technologies that scientists have to use in order to conduct experiments on a molecular and sometimes atomic level in order to understand how the human organism really works, how disease really works, and how to best go about treating it. And again, I just want to say science is making advances with medicine. Victor Hoddeff, again, he talked about this in Entering Wedge Part 2. And we have videos on YouTube going through this. We have an audio book of the Entering Wedge Part 2 on YouTube. We have a study called Reforming Health Reform and Thinking, in which we introduce Entering Wedge Part 2 and highlight some of the main elements relevant to our discussion today that are found in that book. And Victor Hoddeff points out that clearly modern medicine is a good thing. Life expectancy has gone up dramatically due to modern medicine. We're able to treat diabetes. I'm sure everyone on the call knows that Teresa has type 1 diabetes, and she is dependent upon insulin in order to live. If it was not for modern science-based medicine, Teresa would not be alive right now. And remarkably, scientists for years have been working on creating an artificial pancreas so that type 1 diabetics don't have to take shots every day and have a really difficult time controlling blood sugars and things like that. But guess what? Scientists are working hard to create an artificial pancreas, so that type 1 diabetics will be effectively cured. And it's a very real possibility that within the next 10 years, that technology may be available for your average type 1 diabetic, at least in developed countries. But here's the thing. That's not going to happen if the people doing that research do not have the funding to do it. And it is a crying shame that billions of dollars are being spent on homeopathy and on naturopathy and on acupuncture and energy healing and all of these other things that have no scientific backing, no experimental verification. This world could right now be a far, far better place for all of us, and suffering could be greatly decreased if only we viewed science rightly. And we will not view science rightly if we view experience wrongly. Mm. If we think that we can have legitimate conclusions and legitimate actions and thoughts by depending upon our experience, our day-to-day -day experience, by depending on so-called common sense, depending on so-called faith, then we are sadly mistaken and we will contribute to dragging this world back into the dark ages for religion, for health, for technology, and in every other way. So let's not do that. But in order to not do that, we need to view experience rightly. We need to view how to come to truth rightly. And we need to view science rightly. And the reason why I'm emphasizing science in our discussion is because that is a point that we have not greatly emphasized thus far. 
but which needs to be rightly emphasized because there is a prevalent anti-science perspective to varying degrees among branches, the Gideons, Adventists, Christians, religious folk in general. And that needs to come to an end. We need to recognize how good of a thing science is, and we need to recognize that scientists are among those people in the world who are closest to understanding right principle and who are actually applying the methods which Ellen White so clearly advocates in this testimony experience not reliable. And in this regard, in terms of employing experimental methods for arriving at conclusions, scientists, and I'm talking secular scientists, who religious folk and branches so often demonize, they have been following the principles Ellen White advocates in this testimony far, far, far better than we have. So we need to realize that, and we need to realize that there are people out there who have been following elements of truth and elements of principle way better than we have, and let's stop condemning them and condemning their conclusions and condemning what they do when they know far better than we do because we have not been following the counsel in this testimony, and they have not even knowing. So with all that said, I want to read the last paragraph that we read the entirety of in last weekend's meeting, last Saturday night's meeting, which is the first paragraph of Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 71. We'll read that and then continue on into the next paragraph. Experience is said to be the best teacher. Genuine experience is indeed superior to book knowledge. But habits and customs gird men and women as with iron bands, and they are generally justified by experience, according to the common understanding of the term. Very many have abused precious experience. They have clung to their injurious habits, which are decidedly enfeebling to physical, mental, and moral health. And when you seek to instruct them, they sanction their course by referring to their experience. But true experience is in harmony with natural law and science. Cool. Yes, so clearly stated. Now, going on to the next paragraph. Here is where we have met the greatest difficulty in religious matters. Mm. The plainest facts may be presented, the clearest truths sustained by the Word of God may be brought before the mind, but the ear and heart are closed, and the all-convincing argument is my experience. Some will say, the Lord has blessed me in believing and doing as I have. Therefore, I cannot be in error. My experience is clung to, and the most elevating, sanctifying truths of the Bible are rejected for what they are pleased to style experience. Now, I want to pause here. Ellen White is pointing out that this principle, which she has thus far in the testimony been discussing solely in relation to health, applies to more spheres of life 
than health alone. She is applying it to religion, and she says that this is where we have met the greatest difficulties in religious matters. Notice that she's pointing out that this is the biggest problem when it comes to religious issues. This is similar to what she said earlier when she said that this is the reason, a false understanding of experience is the number one reason why false ideas are received and firmly retained. The way that she put it on page 69 is there are more errors received and firmly retained from false ideas of experience than from any other cause. That is incredible. So she's applying this very broadly, not just health and not just religion. It's just there are more errors received and firmly retained from false ideas of experience than from any other cause. That is incredible. This should cause us to realize that this subject is so very important. Now, what people term their experience, they also refer to as being the basis for their faith. So this also has to do with faith. And Ellen White, in another place, says that there is no knowledge more essential than that of how to cultivate faith. So this is the most important subject. Of course, it is in connection with and inseparable from materialism, which is dealing with the foundation of all things. So these foundational, fundamental subjects all really all blend together into one, and this is the most important subject, period. And it's interesting that this relates so intimately with science. Mm -hmm. So, Ellen White, in saying, but true experience is in harmony with natural law and science, here is where we have met the greatest difficulties in religious matters. That's going from one sentence to the next sentence. The first sentence ended the first paragraph on page 71. The next sentence that I read continues on being the first sentence of the next paragraph. Ellen White is clearly advocating a scientific approach even to religious matters and explaining that the lack of scientific approach is what causes the greatest problem. Evidence may be presented, but people reject that evidence in favor of their experience. They say, the Lord has blessed me in believing and doing as I have. Therefore, I cannot be in error. We have to make sure not to do that. For example, if you believe that the Lord has blessed you and you have had a great experience in thinking that science is contrary to the beliefs that you should have and in thinking that faith is really what fills the gap between knowledge and belief, and in thinking that you are justified in believing things that you do not know, and that you don't really need to have rigorous scientific experiment upon which to base your beliefs. If that's your experience, and you feel the Lord has blessed you in that, and thus you're going to cling to that rather than accepting this truth and these series of facts that we are presenting today, then that would be an example of applying a false idea of experience to religious matters and to all matters, ultimately, because we're talking about the principles. So we need to really reform our thinking. 
I'll continue on with Ellen White's testimony. Many of the grossest habits are cherished under the plea of experience. Now, I want to pause here to point out, if there is something that you cling to or that you prop up as being valid due to experience, if you say, well, I tried it and it worked, I don't care if there have been no scientific experiments. I tried it, and it worked. (laughs) The problem with that is that you know that that is not a reliable method because you know that others use that same method pointing to their experience in order to prop up and justify things which are not true. Like Ellen White says here, Many of the grossest habits are cherished under the plea of experience. In Ellen White's day, some of the things that I'm sure she had in mind were the use of tobacco, like whether it's chewing tobacco or smoking tobacco, drinking alcohol, different things like that. People can point to their experience. Today, of course, most people even who are users of tobacco, acknowledge its harmfulness and so on. But there are other issues today and there are other practices that everyone here would acknowledge as being not valid and yet people justify those practices by their experience. So if you're justifying something by your experience and you think that you don't need scientific backing for whatever it may be, know that you are on no better ground than they are. Even if it turns out that the thing that you're using or promoting is actually valid, you have no justification in using or promoting it unless and until It is backed by science. And when we talk about backed by science, again, as I pointed out at the end of our last meeting, I don't mean that you can find a study that supposedly proves it to work. No, it means that there should be a body of evidence and everything needs to be taken into account. If you find 20 studies, that say homeopathy works when there have been 2,000 that show that it doesn't and you side with the 20, that isn't going with the weight of evidence unless you can show that the 2,000 were all very poorly conducted, small sample, you know, whatever, and that the 20 were massively well done studies with long periods of time, many people involved and whatever, you know, the methods of the studies have to be taken into consideration, the amount of people, the time involved, and, you know, some of those things are more relevant and some of them are less relevant depending on what the issue is, what is being studied. But this is why Ellen White says that there needs to be a knowledge of the principle involved in the action. That's why that is so important, because you need to know even what to test. This is the difference between science-based medicine and so-called evidence-based medicine. Science-based medicine cares about the principle involved in the action, whereas evidence-based medicine, or I'll say again, so-called evidence-based medicine, does not necessarily take that into account. Again, for that distinction, I recommend watching the series of lectures by Harriet Hall called Science-Based Medicine. You can find it on YouTube, on the James Randi Foundation YouTube channel. And I also recommend checking out the Science-Based Medicine blog. You can just go on Google, type in Science-Based Medicine blog, you'll find it. You can go on bdsba.com forward slash resources and scroll down to the health section 
and it links to the Science-Based Medicine blog and other excellent resources on health. Anyway, it's very important to realize that the method is important and that none of us can be justified in using our experience to prop up or justify our beliefs or habits or practices. Continuing, many fail to reach that physical, intellectual, and moral improvement which it is their privilege and duty to attain because they will contend for the reliability and safety of their experience. Although that misjudged experience is opposed to the plainest revealed facts. I think that's worth reading again. I might not need to comment on it, but I will read it again. Many fail to reach that physical, intellectual, and moral improvement which it is their privilege and duty to attain because they will contend for the reliability and safety of their experience, although that misjudged experience is opposed to the plainest revealed facts. Perhaps I will make a comment. Obviously, when she says plainest revealed facts, she does not mean that it is plain and obvious to the person depending on their experience. Obviously, it is not plain and obvious to them. It is a plainly revealed fact due to it being evidenced by means of experiment. That is why it is a plainly revealed fact. And I think it's so important to realize that Ellen White is emphasizing the horrible effects of depending upon experience and how we should not contend for the reliability and safety of our own experience. We should not look at our experience as being reliable, period. If you have done something I'll again use health as an example. Let's say you, you have a ongoing ailment and you've had it for years and there's something that you've been using in order to treat it and it seems to have worked for you. You've had an experience of it benefiting you in some way. Do not consider that experience to be reliable. Don't use that as evidence that whatever the product or herb or supplement or drug or whatever, don't use that as evidence that it works. Because it is not evidence that it works. Why? Because experience is not reliable. That's the entire point of this testimony. You should only consider your experience to be in harmony with reality. It doesn't mean that it becomes then an indication, but it just matches it. The only way to know is by actual experiment, scientific experiment. So whatever it is needs to be validated. The way that you can say, oh, this works, is by showing this has been scientifically verified to work. And if you happen to have experiences that go along with that, then that is wonderful, because now you know that those are genuine experiences. Without the scientific verification, you do not know that those are genuine experiences, and thus you shouldn't view them as genuine experiences, nor should you promote others to, you should not promote for others to use what you have supposedly verified by experience. No, you should only recommend for others that which has been scientifically verified. Continuing. 
men and women whose wrong habits have destroyed their constitution and health will be found recommending their experience as safe for others to follow when it is this very experience that has robbed them of vitality and health. I want you to seriously consider that you may be guilty of this. The testimonies aren't here for the purpose of us sitting here and thinking, oh man, yeah, there's people who do that. Mm -hmm. If you think along those lines, you will lose the potential benefit of this testimony. Ellen White writes about the object of the testimonies. And you can find it in two places. You can find it in Volume 2 of the Testimonies, and you can find it in Volume 5. And I have videos on both. But the whole purpose of the testimony is to get us to self-examine, to find out if we are guilty of this. That's the purpose of publishing these testimonies. Absolutely. And so, again, I'm going to read this. And though Ellen White is saying men and women, he's speaking in third person. Ask yourself if this is you. And don't come to your conclusion as to whether this is you by feelings. No. Face the facts. Face the facts of your own case. Ask yourself, do you really know if that which you are using and that which you are recommending to others is actually backed by valid science? I'm not talking about naturopaths and alternative medicine. I'm talking about secular experimental science. Because guess what? In the alternative medicine field, there is not the rigorous standards of experimental science that there is in actual science. Chemistry, biology, you know, like in order to get a real PhD in biology and chemistry and in specific fields addressed to study specific diseases, that requires a lot of valid education, of real education, of learning science, learning the findings and the methods of science. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about people in alternative health doing some studies. So you need to ask if what you are using and what you are recommending to others is backed by actual science. So I'm going to read the statement again. Men and women whose wrong habits have destroyed their constitution and health will be found recommending their experience as safe for others to follow when it is this very experience that has robbed them of vitality and health. not about others doing that. It's about whether you have done and are doing that. Again, don't recommend your experience to others. Don't recommend the experience of others to others. Oh, read this testimonial. Look at this. Look at all these great reviews. As though that means something. You can find the same stuff the same experiences, you can find just as many testimonials in favor of homeopathy, in favor of acupuncture, in favor of distance healing, in favor of energy healing, in favor of faith healing by people like Peter Popov, who was proven to be a fraud, like actually demonstrated well beyond a reasonable doubt. Caught red-handed, absolutely. 
and yet people still swear by the miracle water. And they have their testimonies. They have their experiences. Let's not do that same thing. No. Even if something gave you experiences of benefit, do not use those experiences of benefit to advocate to others or even to yourself that it supposedly works. Only say it works if it's backed by science. Because that's the only way that you will know it works. No matter how much you may feel you know, you do not know unless it is backed by science. That's the point of this testimony. Please realize that. Please realize that if you reject that point, you reject this testimony by Ellen White. And Ellen White, in this testimony, is saying that this is the biggest issue when it comes to religion. It is the biggest issue when it comes to health. It is the biggest issue when it comes to every issue. This is the message, guys. I'll continue on reading what Ellen White has written here. Many examples might be given to show how men and women have been deceived by relying upon their experience. I'll read that again. Many examples might be given to show how men and women have been deceived by relying upon their experience. And that's the last sentence of this paragraph. And indeed, many examples could be given, and the alternative health field is full of such examples. There are examples given in Harriet Hall's series of lectures, Science-Based Medicine, there's also an individual, I'm going to see if I can find her name, who Teresa and I recently came across. She was trained as a naturopath. Okay. Yeah, there it is. Yes. So there's a, a woman, her name is Britt Marie Hermes, and she has a blog called naturopathic diaries you can find it at www.naturopathicdiaries.com and there's a wikipedia page on her i'll just read the very beginning of the wikipedia page Britt marie hermes is an american former naturopathic doctor who became a critic of naturopathy and alternative medicine she is the author of a blog naturopathic diaries where she writes about being trained and having practiced as a licensed naturopath, and about the problems with naturopaths as medical practitioners. Hermes' writings deal with the education and practices of licensed naturopaths in North America, and she is a noted opponent of alternative medicine. Hermes has been dubbed a whistleblower on the naturopathic profession and a quote-unquote naturopathic apostate. And the fact is, she found out, like she was working as a naturopath, and basically her boss at her institute was treating people with a so-called cancer medication that was illegal. It was a federal offense to use this drug because it was not approved by the FDA, and definitely for cancer treatments, it needs to be approved by the FDA. And it turned out, that the guy who was supplying that drug ended up being arrested because he was just taking drugs that were expired and relabeling them and selling them. He was from some other country, I think, and he was selling them to yeah. naturopaths in America. Another country, but I forget which one. Yeah. So that's what these people were getting from these naturopaths. They were getting something that was supposed to be some herb that was really just expired drugs that were actually dangerous and not approved. And, yeah, I mean, there's lots of, you know, there are other examples that 
this woman gives, which is why I'm mentioning it, because Elmite says there are many examples that could be given, and I'm just pointing you guys to some places where you can find some real examples. And another thing, in an interview that we watched with Brit Hermes, she was pointing out about the so-called number one naturopathic institute in the United States and how they recently held a conference on bloodletting. And literally, like, taking these little hammers and... With all these spikes on it. Yeah, hammering it against your skin till you start bleeding. And it's supposed to treat all these different diseases. And, like, it's, oh, it's just... Crazy. It's crazy. And that is at the number one naturopathic institute in North America. This is the sort of thing why science-based medicine is so important and why alternative medicine is not only not proven, not only is it full of a quackery, but it is immoral. It is bad the for children the world. And infants that have died just for lack of proper medical care in delivery and, and whatnot, like, you know, untrained, un qualified and unequipped conditions for delivering babies with complications and not calling in the paramedics early enough and the baby dies simply because they didn't have proper methods of, you know, they couldn't do a C-section, couldn't do all these different things that would have been done had an actual doctor been delivering this baby. Absolutely. It's so sad. And here's the thing. It has been experimentally shown that alternative medicine practitioners, naturopaths and otherwise, are statistically less likely, like they are generally less able to recognize a person in need of emergency care than are medical doctors and I don't know if this has been experimentally verified, but it is implied to be true. They are even less likely than your average individual to really recognize a medical emergency and to do something about it because they believe that they have something that they can use to benefit the person. Someone who isn't a practitioner in alternative health or in mainstream medicine may recognize something bad is happening. I don't know what to do. I'm going to take this person to the hospital just in case. Whereas someone who is a alternative medicine practitioner feels like they have something that they can do, even though it's not actually scientifically evidenced to be valid. And there are many examples of people in need of emergency care and they were not given emergency care or taken to a hospital or an ambulance called or whatever when they're under the care of an alternative medicine practitioner because they felt like, oh, well, I'll just give them this homeopathic pill or, oh, I'll just rub this ointment on them or, oh, I'll just do this other thing that's supposed to help. And people have died as a result. You can find many examples of this. But I'll mention something that I mentioned at the beginning of the call again. And that is the bigger issue being that the alternative health field is a multi-billion dollar per year industry. And the promotion of that is perpetuating huge amounts of suffering in this world. If we changed and promoted real science-based medicine, there would be far less suffering because there would be more research on how to fight disease. There would be more money put to developing effective treatments that are based on science. So I really want to emphasize that how we view science in regard to health and other issues is a moral issue. And 
promoting alternative medicine is immoral, and the only moral thing to do when it comes to medicine is to promote science-based medicine. That's the only thing that is according to love, because we should care whether something has been verified to actually work before we recommend it to others. To recommend to someone something that may not actually work, or may potentially be harmful, and we just don't know because we don't have actual experiment, but we just feel like we know, is damaging, and it's wrong, and it's not loving to others. So this is the position that we, Branch Davidians, Davidians, Adventists, religious folk, find ourselves in, that we have been promoting immorality by promoting alternative health, by promoting things that are not backed by science, when we need to be promoting what is backed by science. And if we do this, guys, like if we really change in this regard, we can contribute to bettering the world hugely, and you can better yourself hugely by actually accepting this message. When I say this message, I mean everything that we're talking about tonight, which is really the main point of this present message, and evidently, according to this testimony that we're reading from Ellen White, it is fundamental and foundational to her message as well. So anyway, we won't read more tonight, considering how long we've been on the meeting, but I really hope you guys consider this really seriously. And again, Victor Hodge has talked about how important it is to reform once you come to a knowledge of the truth. There's a place where he said that if you do not begin to reform once you come to a knowledge of the truth, I forget if he says you can, uh, that you will never or you may never. I don't think he says can, but I think he says you may never or you will never reform. I don't remember. If you don't begin to once you hear it, it's like, I, I would say you at least have no guarantee of, of reforming if we really love the truth. Remember, guys, also remember the new moon calls that we've had emphasizing today this is the time. What is salvation? It's doing what you know to do now. Once you have a, a correction on something, that moment, receive that correction and start to abide by it. That's the sanctified life. That's what it is. That's what salvation is, doing that moment by moment. If you don't, it reveals that you do not love the truth and you are not abiding by the truth, that you are acting upon presumption rather than faith, and whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If you do not receive the message, you are walking in sin and you are lost and you need salvation, and it is the truth that sets you free. Don't refuse, like this is the medicine right now, this is it. Don't refuse this now. That's just accepting death. That's just accepting sin and lies and error. No, accept this message now. I cannot imagine that anyone here in this call tonight could possibly think that the principles that we're advocating are not true. It's so plainly true. How could we just decide to not perform our thoughts and actions to be in harmony with it? So anyway, thank you guys for listening. Please consider this. And Heavenly Family, I want to thank you 
for guiding us to these principles. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask that you impress it strongly on the hearts of everyone here to receive this message and to apply it to all facets of life. We ask this knowing that it is in harmony with your will and that it is for the sake of the upbuilding of your kingdom and the end of sin and that it ultimately is the purpose that you have established from the foundation of the world. So thank you so much. We ask this B'Shem Tzemach Huahi in the name of Branch, he and she. Amen. Amen. Anyway, guys, um, I don't want to get into questions and, and comments and all that right now just because I want to leave you thinking with this. If you do have questions and comments, save it for tomorrow night and at the beginning of the meeting we'll we'll go through that if anyone does have anything and if not, we'll get right back into the testimony because this is a gold mine guys. There's so much so much beauty and so much principle. Ellen might explain it so clearly in this testimony. So that said, love you all very much. Happy Sabbath. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys on tomorrow night's meeting. Shalom, everyone. Shalom. Good night.